Hello students, this is the beginning of lecture six, quantitative genetics and behavior. And this is the first video of several for this uh, topic. So I want to um, pop open my PowerPoint for this topic. Find it here. There we go. Excellent. Uh, this topic is called Nature via Nurture, Quantitative and Behavioral Genetics. Now, we've already seen in the last lecture that some traits um, are influenced by a single gene. Even a single gene can contribute to um, some, uh, some traits like nurturing behavior in mice, right? But more often, um, many traits, maybe even most traits, are influenced by more than one gene. A trait that's influenced by, by more than one gene is called a polygenic, many gene trait, polygenic trait. And um, polygenic traits are often also influenced by the environment. And so um, traits that are behavioral traits, traits that are physical traits, um, are typic, are many, many traits are what we call polygenic traits. And we're going to be thinking about these kinds of traits in, in this particular lecture. We're going to take a look at um, traits or characters that show continuous variation. These are typically polygenic traits. We're going to talk about heritability of that trait uh, we'll briefly dive into twin studies and why they're interesting. And then we'll go through an example of the trait of intelligence and um, how we can go about thinking about the role of, of genetics and environment on these more complex traits like intelligence or personality, for example. Okay, so... <clears throat> Quantitative genetics, or be, yeah, quantitative genetics is by the definition goes something like this. It's the study of characters that show continuous variation, the study of characters or traits, behavior, most behavior traits fit into this category, the study of characters or traits that show continuous variation and we also want to study the mechanisms underlying this variation. So if you're a quantitative geneticist, you're going to be looking at traits that show continuous variation, and you're going to be trying to figure out what mechanisms contribute to that continuous variation. Well, what are some examples of characters or traits that show continuous variation? Now, on the bottom of the screen, I've got this really annoying um, graphic that shows a, a population that that ranges in, um, in height. Um, height is a great example of um, a trait that or a character that shows continuous variation. And so you, uh, you know that there's very tall people out there, there are very short people out there, and then there are basically everybody in between, right? Uh, most people uh, fall into this average category. But then there's people on both extremes. And then this is a nice picture of like a very tall person and a very short person. This is a good example of a uh, trait that shows continuous variation. Other examples might be weight, skin color, IQ, personality. So when you think of personality, maybe we think of different um, components of personality. I studied um, this last year, I was looking at individual variation in uh, black-capped chickadee ch chickadees. And we basically could see with our data that there was um, differences in boldness versus shyness, or maybe we might want to call it risk aversive versus a risk seeker. You know, so you, instead of short versus tall, you could have, you know, like these, uh, I'm just going to go with, you know, the very bold bold to the very, very shy animals, and we have some many animals right in the middle, but some animals that are very bold, that seem to come to the bird feeder all the time, even when there is a predator present. Other animals that really struggle to even get to the feeder. 
Um, and when they did, they didn't stay long, didn't often take a seed. They would be on the shy end of that spectrum. So uh, personality characteristics can um, be considered to show continuous variation as well. These traits, when you've got something that shows continuous variation, uh, are controlled, typically are um, determined by many genes or many loci, locations, right? Um, they have polygenic inheritance. Each gene or each allele is contributing a tiny bit to the, the character or the trait of height or the trait of boldness versus shyness, right? And the environment is going to play a role as well. Um, yeah, okay. So when we look at um, traits that vary continuously, we want to also be thinking about the statistical features of the population. So if we're thinking about height, um, we could calculate, for example, the average height in the American population or in the population of people from Denmark, okay? The average, well, you probably know what that term means. Um, sometimes we write it like X with a bar over it, right? To calculate the mean of something, you would just add up all of the samples and divide by the sample size to get the mean. Okay, so that's one thing we could look at, the mathematical average of a set of numbers. We could also look at the standard deviation or the variance. Both of these are measures of how spread out our data are, or how a measure of the dispersion of a set of data points from the mean. And you see three graphs here that kind of give you a feeling for different dispersions or different data that shows different spread outness, if you will. So in this graph, we've got a very sharp peak near the, near the mean. The data are not very dispersed or not very spread out. Almost all the data fit into a tiny little area. Um, this graph, on the other hand, has much more dispersion in the data. Okay. So how do we measure that or how do we talk about that when we're talking about a population? We want to have some way to talk about how much variation there is in this trait or in this character, right? And so you would use a term like standard deviation or variance. Standard deviation uh, it has a pretty complicated, um, it's pretty complicated to, to calculate, but, but don't worry about that. It's basically a measure uh, for all of the data points in the population. Um, it's a measure of the data point dispersion from the mean or difference from the mean. So here you've got for every single data point, you subtract the mean, square that thing, and then divide by the sample size or the sample size minus one. That's what n minus one is. And then for standard deviation, take the square root of the whole business. The standard deviation gives us a standard or a way to talk about how much variation there is around the mean. What is the standard deviation? How much variation is there around the mean? And I will tell you that the standard deviation for a population like this is going to be very low. The standard deviation for a population like that is going to be bigger. Right? There's more variation around the mean in, the, in this graph down here. Okay, variance is another way to um, measure dispersion in a set of points. In fact, the variance is simply the standard deviation squared. So if you got rid of this square root symbol, um, that's what variance is. So when we want to write down what variance is, we could say it's the square of the standard deviation. Or you could just say it's another way to measure how much dispersion there is in a set of data or how much variation there is around um, the mean, how much spread in the data is there. Okay, and the reason we're, we need to define that is uh, we, when we're talking about and thinking about um, traits that show uh, continuous variation, um, we want to ask the question, hmm, how much of this variation is due to differences in genetics? And how much of this variation is due to differences in the environment? Okay. Questions to consider when studying a trait that shows continuous variation. Here we go. 
Is the variation that we see, let's say, in boldness versus shyness in our black cap chickadees, is the variation that we observe in the character influenced by genetic variation? Are, are all of the differences we see between our black cap chickadees due to differences in genes? And if, if it is influenced, in some way by genetic variation, how important is the genetic variation? How, how is, is all of the different, are all of the differences that we see in the phenotip, in the phenotype accountable or not accountable, but attributed to differences in genetics? Or just maybe a little bit. That's what we want to determine. Can we somehow determine how much of the phenotypic variation we see in human height or in IQ or in personality or in personality in black capped chickadees? Can we determine how much of the phenotypic variation we see is attributed to variation in genetics? Um, and therefore, how much is determined by other, other factors like the environment? What component of this variation that we see out there is due to differences in genes versus differences in environment? Can we come up with some way to measure that? And we do. We come up with um, a, a term called heritability. And you've probably heard this term many times. You might say, oh, wow, uh, yeah, schizophrenia is heritable. Or you might say height is heritable is a highly heritable trait, or, oh, um, I've heard that autism is highly heritable, or, you know, boldness and shyness in black capped chickadees is heritable. What does that actually mean? Well, a general term, uh, sorry, a general definition for heritability might go something like this. Heritability is the extent to which variation in a trait can be attributed to variation in genetics. The extent to which variation in a trait can be attributed to variation in genetics. So if something is highly heritable, you would say, oh, most of the variation in this trait can be attributed to differences in genetics. Does that make sense? Um, differences um, in genetics can account for a high proportion of the variation in the phenotype that we see. So when we define heritability, heritability, we actually use the letter capital H. Sometimes we use the lowercase h with a with a square behind it. That's called heritability in the narrow sense. We're not going to worry too much about these differences, but we need to understand something about phenotypic variation the variance in a phenotype. So if we're looking at, uh, if we're looking at, you know, human height or IQ or personality differences along a scale um, of, you know, boldness to shyness or risk averse to risk seeking, whatever it is we're looking at, the phenotypic variance is due to the variance due to genetics, that's VG, plus the variance due to the environment. Okay, that makes sense. You got your genetic component, you got your variation due to or because of the environment. The VG component is actually kind of complicated. It, um, the variance due to genetics is um, is um, actually kind of can be subdivided into variance due to additive genetics, variance due to dominance effects, and variance due to interactions between the gene and the environment. But but the basic idea is. Phenotypic variance we see is equal to the variance in genetics plus the variance in environment. Okay. But what heritability is, heritability is the proportion of phenotypic variance that's caused by genetic factors. The proportion of phenotypic variance caused by genetic factors. So H is equal the variance due to genetic factors divided by the total variance, the phenotypic variance. And this number is always going to range between 0 and 1. It's a proportion. So we might say heritability is high 
um, if heritability is high, maybe we have a heritability value of 0.8. That would say that, um, you know, the, the differences we see in this trait can be, you know, 80% accounted for by differences in genetics. So heritability give us, gives us an idea of, um, you know, when we're looking at a, a continuously varying trait, and we see this variation, we're like, wow, where did all this variation come from? Well, heritability can tell us about how much of that variation is due to variation in genetics, okay, in one's genetic makeup. Okay, so how do you go about measuring heritability? I want to know, like, how much of our the variation we see out there in personality is due to genetic factors or genetic variants. How do you measure that? Well, there are a couple of different ways. Some ways are, are less likely to work with human populations, but one of the ways you can do it is you can estimate the components of variants by minimizing one component. So you could take genetically identical plants, in that case, V g is zero right because we got genetically identical plants any differences we see are not going to be due to genetics because there's no variation in our genes in genetically identical plants and stick them in totally different environments maybe environments where there's less sun or more sun or different soil types or um, different temperature or climate types right and then look at the variation and all of that variation should be due to environment it would be something like taking, you know, identical triplets and raising them in totally different environments. One of them is raised in a North American really wealthy home, and one is raised in Southeast Asia, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, outside in a, you know, in, a, in a small village, and one is raised on the moon. <laughs> Genetically speaking, there's no variation. Whatever variation we see in their personality or in their height or in their IQ is due to the environment then. So you can do that. Of course, you can't do that with humans, right? At least you can't intentionally do that. But you could do this with animals in some situations. You can get genetically or very close to genetically identical animals like mice, lab mice, um, rats, things like that. Okay. Or other um, animals like fruit flies. You could also try to set the environment, the variation in the environment to zero. So for example, you could um, measure the amount of milk produced by genetically variable cows that are living in identical conditions. So you take a bunch of cows and they're, they're genetically variable, but you raise them in an identical way, right? You give them the same amount of food, the same amount of light, the same amount of attention. You um, milk them at the same time of day. Everything is the same. And then the variation that you see in milk production should be due to variation in genetics, whatever that variation is. That's one way that you can measure heritability or get a feeling for how important um, variation in genetics is to contributing to this trait. The other thing you could do is you could measure similarities between relatives. Okay, and this is, often done in human uh, studies. It's <laughs> the more ethical approach to, to working if you're, if you're studying um, heritability in a human trait. This is what's often done. And so here's the idea, and it's a little bit complicated, but we're not going to worry too much about this as long as we get some understanding of heritability. Because we're going to talk about this a lot as we move through the semester. So here's the idea. What you want to do is you want to compare the amount of similarity between relatives, the amount of similarity in a trait, whether that trait is height or IQ or personality, these are kind of the big ones that have been done. Compare the amount of similarity in a trait between relatives to the expected amount of similarity between relatives due to similar genes. Okay, so we know that, for example, identical twins have the exact same genetic makeup. Their expected similarity due to similar genes would be uh, would be 100%. If we did a correlation 
between traits. So if we decided to look at the height of one um, individual and the height of his identical twin, we would expect the expected amount of similarity between relatives due to similar genes should be 100%, should be 1. What we can do is then compare the actual amount of similarity between these relatives to what we would expect if, if genetics is the only thing contributing to this, um, to this trait. We can calculate what are called correlation coefficients uh, to look at relationships between uh, characteristics or characters um, of, of relatives basically, and we can get different kinds of correlations. We could get a uh, uh, situation in which all the dots fall in a single line. We would say that that's a correlation of one. We could get a little more scatter, okay, the correlation value drops a little, or even a little more scatter, or ooh, this represents no correlation. There's so much scatter, there's no correlation between these numbers. Or you could maybe even get negative correlations and even a negative correlation of negative one, a perfect correlation, but negative. So correlation coefficients range from one to negative one, basically. We would expect if we were working with, if we were working with um, identical twins, we would expect their, the similarity in their genes is 100. So their correlation coefficient um, for uh, their expected correlation coefficient, if all of this variation is due to genetic makeup, is 1. Their, what they actually have, their correlation, co their correlation coefficient that we observe, we have to find out. We have to figure it out. And here's the kicker. We can talk about heritability. And that's way down here. I don't know if you can see all that. We can talk about heritability in the narrow sense, or H little h squared is another way to write heritability in the narrow sense, um, as the proportion of phenotypic variance due to additive genetic effects. We can calculate this using correlation coefficients. So if we take the correlation coefficient that we observed divided by the correlation coefficient, um, I do not want that to happen. How do I get out of here now? Yeah. I do not want this at all. <laughs> we'll move back to this. Everything is disappearing on me, and I really want to get back to it. So I will head back over there. I don't seem to even see my PowerPoint. <sighs> okay, let me hunt for my PowerPoint a minute. Wow, it just seemed to have totally disappeared. That's terrible. Oh boy, I don't know what you're seeing. I'm not going to worry about it. Crazy. Okay, maybe you can see this. Okay. All right, so what we can do is we can calculate heritability based on this has not been my friend today. Heritability, in the narrow sense, as the proportion of phenotypic variance due to additive genetic effects. That's what the VA is, okay? So in other words, we still are looking at the proportion of variance out there that's due, that's, um, due to um, variation in genetics, okay? And I want to give you an example of how to do that calculation on the next slide. Okay, so this slide shows us um, some data for parent height and child height. So we've got a parent and a child. And we plotted the data so that the parent height is on the x-axis and the child's height is on the y-axis. And we get some scatter. But we get a, a, a kind of a positive line, which makes sense. Tall parents tend to have tall kids, right? That's not a surprise. And we measure the correlation coefficient for the, these data. You can, you can measure it. And I get, and that'd be the R observed. The R observed is 0 0.4. So it's pretty high. There's a, that's, that's pretty high. 
The expected correlation coefficient, if all of the variation is due to genetics between a parent and a child, is 0.5 because parents and children share on average 50% of their genes with their child. Okay, so we would the our expected is 0 0.5. Now, from this, I can calculate the heritability of height. The heritability of height is R observed divided by R expected, 0.4 divided by 0 0.5. That's like four fifths, right? No, 0.8. Okay, heritability is going to range from 0 to 1. 0 0.8 is pretty high. This tells us that the proportion of phenotypic variance due to genetics is 80%. That's pretty high due to variation in genes is 80%. And that's that's really about right. That what, that's what researchers find. We can use similarities between relatives to get an estimate of heritability for a particular trait. And that's what's often done in, um, in the kind of literature that you're going to be reading. You're going to see terms like, oh, the heritability for um, neuroticism in, uh, in humans is uh, 0.4. How do they calculate this? Through some mechanism like this. What that means is that, you know, uh, for height at least, a large proportion of phenotypic variance is accounted for by additive genetic um, variance. Okay? Differences in genetic makeup account for a large proportion of the phenotypic variation we see in height. That's what this is saying, okay? And, and these data are actually pretty accurate, the, this made-up example is. Okay, we will move on from here in a minute. Got to close out shop.